Well, it's that time of year again. The last time I was here, around about this time, it was for the same purpose to celebrate with you this Advent season. And we're glad to be back. Glendale Adventist Academy. I want to thank um, Tim and Sherry Hansen for leading out. Let's give them an appreciation. And the chorale. Thank you. And my participants, Jasmine and Joanna, thank you for being available to read at the last minute. Thank you so much. And for all the others, the Hinkle family, that's also uh, alumni and uh, present members, we thank God for Taya and Tyson, who represented that family. Um, they are our hosts, and we are glad that they did a good job. Thank you. Let's, let's appreciate them. And uh, the class of 99, Shanae, uh, well, I'll meet her and ask for alumni dues, you know. But uh, thank you for coming to share with us the children's story this uh, morning. Let's appreciate Shanae again. Okay, I want to thank the pastor, Pastor Mike, and the church for inviting me to share this few words of encouragement with us in this season. Um, let's bow as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because we can be bearers of good news, and we thank you for the privilege of your word that makes that possible so that we can share. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be here to tell us those things that you want us to know, and that at the end of this experience, we'll all be blessed, and we give glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, we all know that Christmas is the biggest season, or the biggest and most critical uh, economic and financial moment for any business, usually businesses that are into merchandise. You know, China, which is mostly um, a Confucius or Buddhist nation, has Christmas as also one of the highest seasons where they sell a lot of merchandise. So we discovered that Christmas is not only for Christians, except maybe for purely Islamic nations where Christmas is outlawed, pretty much everybody acknowledges Christmas all around the world. Even where I come from in Nigeria, we call Christmas Kerisi Messi. You know, that is in Nigeria among the Yorubas. And as I was looking at the stories of Christmas, I thought that just for the next few moments, we will see some observations that links Christmas, that is, the fact of the first coming of Jesus to the fact of his second coming. The fact that Jesus came as a baby and link that to the fact that Jesus is coming as a king. Because sometimes the importance of Christmas is lost on us. You know, jingle bells and uh, mistletoes and uh, wreaths and uh, apple cider, and uh, what else? So many, what? Presents. presents. Oh, they, they are talking now. <laughs> Those who wait for presents are waiting for presents. You know, when I, I first came to this country uh, 26 years ago as a young student at Pasadena, uh, for a seminary in Pasadena, I decided to do the Christmas thing. So for Christmas, I went to the mall, Pasadena Mall, trying to get some presents for my family. And I was there for six hours. It was the hardest experience of my life. <laughs> trying to decide getting walkie-talkies for the boys. And no, they wouldn't like walkie-talkies, maybe bicycles. No. So I was, you know, and it has to be a surprise. So I was 
all over the mall. By the time I was done and I brought home what I brought home, I decided at the family meeting, that was the last Christmas <laughs> gift exchange or gift getting that we're going to have in my family. And that's the way it's been. Because the stress was just, I mean, overwhelming. I just couldn't imagine doing that year in, year out. And for those of us who have to do it, all power to you. <laughs> I was in uh, Galleria, but uh, my wife made me go to the Galleria. <laughs> Just a few days ago, she wanted to get me a new pair of shoes. And she said, you know, I can't buy shoes for you. You have to be there to get your shoes. So would you please come with me on Saturday night? It's still Black Friday. So... I'll go get you some shoes, but I have some things I need to return from when I got it yesterday, you know, so I'll, I'll go with you. So we went, and sure enough, the mall was packed. Finding parking at the Galleria was uh, tough, but we found somewhere, and we, I was able to put the car in there while she was already in. But the point is, this is a season where we stress on so many things, and sometimes forget the important things. The two accounts of uh, the Christmas story, or the birth of Christ, in the Bible are tucked away in Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. So that makes it easy for you to find. Matthew 2 and Luke 2, the first 15 verses in the, uh, the Matthew account, and the first 20 verses in the Luke account. Matthew 2 and Luke 2. <clears throat> I want to share some ob observations with you if, you, if you please. The first thing I observed in the two accounts is that when Jesus was about to be born, those who were in the high echelons of society in the religious sector and the political sector had no clue what was going on. That is, the chief priests, the scribes, and Herod the king did not know a thing about this event that had been prophesied over 900 years with Isaiah and 700 years with Micah about the fact that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. Such that when the wise men, we call them the wise men, they are Magi, which means men who study the stars, astrology, and astronomy, when they came to Jerusalem in search of a king, Herod was alarmed because he is a king. And Herod was such a king that he was willing to even kill members of his family if they stood in his way. So here we had Herod who was approached by these three wise men and were inquiring from him where is he that has been born king of the Jews? And Herod must have looked at himself and said, who else? I'm the king of the Jews. Who are you looking for? And Herod had to put back his composure and call the chief priests and the scribes and said, guys, do you know anything about this king of the Jews stuff? They said, well, let's check. And so they went into the book of Micah. If you come with me, let's go to Micah chapter uh, 5, and we'll take a look at verse 2. Micah comes between Obadiah and Nahum. We're almost there. Those are the parts of the scriptures that you don't usually open, right? You know, those last small prophets. We call them minor prophets, but there's nothing minor about what they did. Here in Micah 5, <clears throat> verse 2, it says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. He is going forth uh, from long ago, from the days of eternity. So here, Bethlehem is named, and so as not to confuse it with any other Bethlehem, it's called Bethlehem Ephrata. 
And this is the same Bethlehem that was first named in the story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. This is the Bethlehem that uh, Elimelech left with his family and went to uh, Moab in search of better uh, opportunities and ended up ruining their opportunities. They all died except for the, the mother, and she got the, uh, the call, as it were, the, the prompting to go back to Bethlehem, and she took Ruth with her. And out of this experience be between Naomi and Ruth came Obed, who became the grandfather of Jesse, of the father of Jesse, who became the father of David, and through whom the line of Jesus came. So that places Bethlehem in the, uh, where it belongs. Thanks, Tim, for that song. How far is it to Bethlehem? So we have Bethlehem as the place of the birth of Jesus. Herod did not know about it. The priests did not even remember it. That the Messiah that Isaiah spoke about in Isaiah 9 verse 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This huge prophecy that I've been waiting for from Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman, was about to be fulfilled. Chief priests did not even care. The scribes who've been holding the books for years did not even know. It took three men from a foreign land, non-Jewish nation, to come searching for a king in Jerusalem and alarm everybody. And here is what I also observed. That even though they found these people who brought the news to them, at the time of its happening, all Herod was able to say is, go check it out. Find out if it's true. Because it looks like, you know, false news. Or fake news. To me, before they had Facebook, I think they had fake news back then too. So he wasn't sure. So go check it out. And if it's true, come back and tell me so I can go and worship him. And none of the chief priests and none of the scribes followed the wise men to go check out this king. That's one observation. That it could be happening right under our noses and we are so high and so uplifted and so occupied and preoccupied that we're not connecting with the Messiah. How busy are you to go to Bethlehem? And how far is Bethlehem? Bethlehem was just 30 miles from Jerusalem on the hillside of Judea. 30 miles from Jerusalem. And none of those people went to check out the newborn king. That's food for thought. This Christmas, there's so much music in the air. And unfortunately, the music is not the music that conveys the Messiah. All I want for Christmas is you. You know? And other Christmas Songs that just tantalize us, enchant us, but never draws us to the Christ, the Messiah of Christmas. I want to thank the choir, the chorale, for drawing our hearts back to the Christ of Christmas. Amen. And church, my encouragement this morning is that those of us who know it and those of us who have the books, those of us who have the manual, and Shanae, thank you again for drawing the hearts of everybody, children included, to the fact that it's not the gifts and it's not the hassles because mothers and fathers, we stress ourselves to so much 
to the point where after, after the gifts are opened, you are disappointed. They open the gifts on Christmas morning and you watch them walk away from it. Or play with it for a while and break it. And then your heart is broken because you feel unappreciated. Whereas the gift of the Son of God that is right before our eyes is unappreciated. But in the Luke account, there's another group of people that we are drawn to. And that's where Jasmine and Joanna read for us. In the hillside of, Jerusalem, of, of, of Bethlehem, which is actually the house of bread, Bethlehem in Hebrew and translated into English, Beth is house. Lahem is bread, the house of bread. So Bethlehem, the house of bread, in the hillside of Bethlehem, the scriptures tell us that there were shepherds watching over the flock by night. And these shepherds, unto them appeared angels singing glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to all men in whom his favor rests. So here on the hillside of Bethlehem were the lowliest of the echelon in that time and space. Shepherds were lowly regarded. And that is why David, the youngest of seven sons, was given the responsibility of keeping the sheep because he was a nobody. Shepherds were out in the fields watching their flock by night, and God chose them to be the ones to whom he tells the news of a Messiah that is born. And what do the shepherds do with the news? What did they do? They ran to go check it out. What did the high priest do with the news? They stayed put, thinking it was fake news. And they read it in their book to those foreigners who came from far away. And where did the foreigners get the news from? Turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Here, the context of this story is when the children of Israel were going through Moab and Balaam had been hired by Balak to curse them because he couldn't fight them. So he felt, well, if I curse them, it will be easier than trying to kill two million people. Just curse them and let God take care of it. So he hired a prophet to come curse them and the prophet said, look, I can't curse a people God has blessed. You bless, nobody can curse you. The blessing of the Lord is upon your life. I'm speaking to someone right now. The blessing of the Lord is upon your life. And because of that, no one can curse you. It doesn't matter how many spells they cast, it cannot stick because you belong to Christ. Amen? Amen. So he said, come curse them. He said, I can't curse them because God finds no iniquity in Jacob. And so, finally, the man that was hired to curse started prophesying, started speaking things that were going to happen in the future. And here we have it. In chapter 24, verse 17, he prophesied about the Messiah. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sith. Here the prophecy of a coming Messiah was reactivated. Genesis 3 verse 15 says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman between her seed and your seed. He shall bruise your heel and you shall crush his head. 
So the prophecy was given to Adam and Eve. But the prophecy is renewed here even by a foreign prophet, Balaam, who says, I see a star, and the star will come out of Israel. It will come out of Jacob, and this star will have a scepter. It will become a king. So men in the eastern parts who had the same Torah, the five books of Moses, were studying them. And they looked at everything, and they saw the star. They said, that is the star that was spoken of in the book of Numbers. Let's go check it out in Israel. And they started heading out. And they headed out to Israel just about the time the star of the angels who were proclaiming the birth of Jesus appeared. And because it was a strange and different star from all the others they've studied, they connected it to this prophecy and it was right on time. That prophecy was fulfilled. Other prophecies will be fulfilled. But what will we do about it? Jesus gave a prophecy. One of the most favorite passages of scripture that we love as Seventh-day Adventists. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. We memorize it. Anybody else here who memorizes it in MV or, or Pathfinders? Anybody? Okay, if you know it in the King James Version, let's say it together. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Who made that statement? Jesus. If Jesus gives a prophecy, will it come to pass? It will. Moses wrote the prophecy of Balaam. And that prophecy was confirmed by foreigners who came from the east. And that prophecy was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. But it took lowly shepherds to take it seriously. And by the way, they did it at the risk of their business. Who stayed with the sheep? Maybe they had a designated guy. He said, come on, I want to go too. Sorry, you stay with the sheep. And they dashed into town to go check it out. What will you do with the news of Jesus? Is it lost on you? Is it lost on me? Am I too busy? Am I too sophisticated to tell somebody that Jesus came as a baby, he's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I need to give my heart to him. I need to give my life to him. And I let, let him have control of my life. The last point I'm going to make of my observations on the two accounts of the birth of Jesus is the fact that the government of the day was involved in the fulfillment of these prophecies. The first was the fact that Herod was the one that was approached by this wise man. They didn't go to anybody else. They just went to the government. You should know. And the government did not know. But the government decided to do something about it. Go check it out. Let's see if it's true. If it's true, I'll go worship him too. And they got there and found out it was true. And the next day, the Bible tells us, an angel came, spoke to Joseph and said, Joseph, get out of town. Leave now. I gave you a credit card yesterday. Give him a gold coin. Now you can travel. First class. So Joseph took the mother and the baby and took off and left for Egypt. What did Herod do about it? 
He didn't hear back from those people. And so he went into town to Bethlehem and killed all the babies in town. The government was involved. Herod went to Bethlehem. But by the time he got to Bethlehem, Jesus was gone. How soon will you go to Bethlehem? How soon will you take the news seriously? How soon will you do something about the news you've heard? By the time he got there, Jesus was gone. The baby was no longer in the manger. The baby was under the pyramids in Egypt, hiding away from a wicked king. But on the other hand, in the Luke account, we are told that Augustus Caesar, the Roman emperor at the time, who was in charge of the whole world, was the one who prompted the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because Joseph and Mary, who were betrothed to be married, were living in Galilee, Nazareth in Galilee. But a king made a decree that everybody must be counted. I mean, do you have to go back to your town to be counted? No. He wanted to take taxes from them. So when you get over to your little town and you wrote your name, come on, give up the taxes. Okay? I think that was their own uh, April 15th, you know, tax time. But that situation, even as mundane as it looked, was what made <clears throat> Joseph leave Galilee, Nazareth, and head to Bethlehem so that the word of God can be fulfilled. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And the government will be involved. Seriously. Have you observed what is going on with our current president? I have nothing against him. But let me tell you, everything you knew about democracy is being challenged right now. You're getting an emperor. You're getting a king. You're getting a monarchy and not a democracy. Everything you thought could not happen in this country is being challenged as we speak. And each of us needs to make a decision. It's not about him. It's not about our president. It's about the fact that some prophecies are about to be fulfilled. I'm not saying that he is the one who is going to bring it in, but I'm saying everything you ever imagined could not happen in this country, as far as the rule of law is concerned, is being challenged. Think about it. Think about it. Congress is challenged by our president calls the bluff of anybody. And if this president can get away with it, guess what? Others are lining up to take precedence from it. And all the liberties we knew and we thought were secured are on the line. I'm not a doomsday prophet, but I'm letting you know that if those who were sitting nice and cozy in Jerusalem thought, oh, come on, another king? They always said that. It could never happen. There's a Herod on the throne. There's no other king but Herod. And it happened. The baby was born. Herod could not kill the baby because God was so many steps ahead. And the baby escaped. We will escape. We will be saved. We will be preserved. But what about those two-year-old and under, those babies in Bethlehem who were slaughtered by Herod? Could they have been warned? Could they also have gotten out of town? But we thank God because those shepherds decided to do something in Bethlehem. They went and spread the news that the Messiah has been born, that there is hope, that there is hope of salvation, and that Jesus was born. You know, as we celebrate this Christmas, I want us to celebrate with joy because the Savior has been born. But on the other hand, let's celebrate it 
with some sobriety, knowing that, yes, Jesus has been born, but who else knows that Jesus is coming again? Who else should know that they should be ready so that when Jesus comes, they too will get out of town before Herod comes through and destroys all the babies? I want to be ready when Jesus comes. You want to be ready when Jesus comes. And sure enough, he's coming. He's coming. Whether I like it or not, Jesus will come again. He said it. And that's why the word Adventist is part of our name. Otherwise, we are just like any other group of Protestant Christians. We are Adventists because we believe that the prophecy about the Messiah will be fulfilled. The promise we read together. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. It's a promise that God, Jesus, gave to Peter. You may say, how? I thought it's for everybody. Yes, for everybody. But what happened was that, and I'm closing right now. I need to take a sip of water if you don't mind. My mouth is pretty dry. Just as after the first communion service, the Lord's Supper, Jesus was talking with the disciples. And he said, I'm just going to be gone from you, and where I'm going, you cannot come. And Peter said, where you go, I'll go, and I will even die with you. Do you know that story? And Jesus said, Peter, you cannot even testify that you know me. You will die with me? Before the rooster crows three times, I mean, crows once, you deny me three times. Peter said, no, over my dead body. And did Peter deny Christ? He did. But before Peter could deny Christ, Jesus gave him a promise. Same breath. I'm reading from the book of John chapter 13, verse 50, the last few verses before you get to the end of uh, chapter 13 and into chapter 14. And Jesus said, Peter, you deny me three times, but let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And here is what I want to say to you. Some of us may not know for sure where we stand if Jesus comes. We may be scared the fact that Jesus is coming. We may look at our lives and think we're not ready. We may think, oh man, what do I have to do to get ready? Jesus said, you believe in me? You believe in the Father? Yeah. Give yourself to me, Peter, fully, because I'm coming to take you. Yes, you deny me. I'll forgive you, but I'm coming back to get you so that where I am, you may be there also. It's not how much we can do to earn salvation with Christ. It's not how much we do not do to earn salvation with Christ. Salvation is a gift. And that was what Jesus assured Peter. Peter, you believe in me. Give yourself to me. Peter, come on my side and I'll give you all it takes to be able to please me. How many of us believe that God can give us all we need to please him? That we don't have to work it up. We don't have to act like we are. But just because we believe he can give it to us, he can. He gave the Holy Spirit. And Peter was a transformed person. Let us bow our heads as we pray. I just want to give you an opportunity to reflect on this thought. Jesus has come as a baby. He's coming again as a king. Lord, I want to be prepared. I don't want to be caught off guard. Lord, give me what it takes to be ready and give me what it takes to tell others that Jesus is coming again. I want you to pray privately and talk to the Lord about what you've heard.
Heavenly Father, we thank you. Because the prophecy about the first coming of Jesus has been fulfilled. The prophecy of his second coming will be fulfilled. Lord, we pray that between the two, you will get us ready. We believe in you, Jesus. We give our hearts to you, Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, just like you did for Peter, so that we also can serve you and please you. Thank you because you are God says you will save us and you will take us to your mansions and we'll live with you forever. May this be our experience in Jesus' name. Amen.